Greetings from Brother Stephen. I'm a disciple and witness of Jesus Christ to all the inhabitants of the earth. I present to you as a witness this gospel of the kingdom. In this lesson today, titled The Blind Beggars, we'll be going over Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. Um, beginning at verse 29. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So the first thing I want to do, and the reason I have um, David in bold and red, is go back to the Old Testament so you know who this David is referring to. And basically, I'm just going to in a, script, a scripture that give you the most important details about David. So if you go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 4 through 17, this is God's covenant with David. This is King David. Verse 4 says, And it came to pass that night that the word of yod came unto Nathan, saying, Go ye tell my servant David. Thus said yod Shall you build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I have commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build you not me a house of cedar? Verse 8 says, Now therefore, so shall ye say unto my servant David, Thus said yod heh of hosts, I take you from the sheep coat. In other words, this just means the flock of the sheep, or from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with you, whithersoever you went, and have cut off all thine enemies out of your sight, and have made you a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of the wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all thine enemies. Also, yod tell you that he will make you an house. And when your days be fulfilled, days be fulfilled just mean when you die, you shall sleep with your fathers and I will set up your seed after you which shall proceed out of your bowels. Out of your bowels just means your testicles. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Now I want to go over a few scriptures so you can understand what this house is um, that, that, that is mentioned in um, 2 Samuel chapter 7. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 12, the subsection of scriptures is known as the living stone and we go over this scripture in the study titled the vineyard workers parable when we cover matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. it says to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of god and precious so now if you go back to isaiah chapter 28 and 16 it gives you a little bit more information about this um, living stone. It says, therefore, thus said Adonai yod behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation. So it's here in Isaiah, it's talking about building, building a house. In Isaiah 28 and 16, lets you know that the foundation of that house um, he lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious 
cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, the reason I have this shall not make haste here, because um, shall not, this shall not make haste comes from one Hebrew word, and it means to make haste. So it say he, the, the way this should be read is he that believe shall make haste. Now, another study you can go to when I go over Isaiah chapter 28, verses 16, when I talk about this living stone in detail, is the study a house on a rock. Um, but we're going back to 1 Peter chapter 2, we have verse 5. It says, ye also as living stones. So um, Christ is that foundation stone. Um, and it says, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house. So um, this house that he's referring to here in the Old Testament, when it says he shall build a house, this is talking about a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So now we're just going back to verse 13. It says, and I will establish my throne and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit any iniquity, now when it's talking about commit any iniquity, this is talking about those living stones in the body of Christ. I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the um, um, stripes of the children of men. This means he will use nations to oppress and persecute you um, for not obeying God. Verse 15 says, but my mercy shall not depart away from him. As I took as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you, and thine house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So again, that was just a quick description so you have an idea who David is. And with that, again, one of the most important things about that about David he is the covenant. <laughs> And the prophecies made to the King David. Now we're going to go to Luke chapter 18 verses 35 to 43. Because um, this subsection of scripture is known is when Jesus heals a blind man. And it is the same um, testimony of Matthew chapter 20 verses 29 to 34. So he says, and it came to pass that as he was come near unto Jericho, a certain blind man set by the wayside, begging, this word here is very important, begging, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant, and they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. Um, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, um, is also a testimony of when Christ heals these blind beggars. It says, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude of people, blind Bartholomew, the son of Timorous, sat by the wayside begging. And when he heard that, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me so before we explain to you who david was now i want to go over a few scriptures and explain why they was calling jesus son of david and to do that we're going to begin in matthew chapter 1 verses 1 through 17 this is the genealogy of jesus and again we have a study titled the genealogy of jesus um, where we go over this genealogy in a previous study also Verse 1 says, the book of Genesis of Jesus Christ, the son, now the son just means descendant of David, um, the son or descendant of Abraham. So it's saying Jesus Christ is a descendant of David, a descendant of Abraham. Um, now what I'm going to do, I don't want to read all of these names. I'm going to jump right down here to verse 6. And it says, and Jesse begat David, 
This is um, King David, David the king, and David the king begat um, Solomon. Now, if you go to 2 Chronicles 2 and 1, one of the things I want to point out, it says, And Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and yod heh his Elohim, was with him and magnified him exceedingly. Um, so again, one of the things you just need to understand is that um, anytime you see the Lord in all caps in the Old Testament, they took the name of yod heh or Yahweh or Jehovah out of the Old Testament scriptures and replaced it with the Lord. The Lord is not a translation. It is adding to the scriptures. Now when it says, and his God. They did the same thing with God. They took the name of Elohim or Adon. And where are we at here? Out of the Old Testament and, pre and, pre and replaced it with God. Um, those are not translations of the accurate Old Testament. So what I do is I go through, um, especially with things that make a significant difference, I put the correct translation um, in its place. So we'll read that again. And Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom. And um, yod heh vav -Heh, his Elohim, was with him and magnified him exceedingly. <laughs> So now we kind of going to go down to verse 16 because here it calls Solomon the son of David. And when you get to verse 16, it says, And Jacob, or Ichabus, begat um, Eosef. Another thing, anytime you see in the New Testament scriptures names that begin with a J, again, those are not translations of their names. Most of those names are just completely made up. There was no J that existed in Hebrew, Greek, or English. The J was not even created to about, um, I believe it's the 1500s. So these names beginning with a J, they're just added to make them sound more American. So again, now again, we have verse 15, and Ichabus begat. Um, this is normally what most people see as Joseph, but it is um, Yosef. And when you go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, it says, But while he taught on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Yosef, you son of David. So you have um, Solomon, which is the direct son of David the king, being referred to as the son of David. Then you have Yosef who's also referred to as the son of David. So when you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 4 through 17, um, God's covenant with David, verse 12 says, And when your days is fulfilled, again, when you die, and ye shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed. This is from Solomon unto Joseph, after you, which shall proceed out of your testicles. So the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew is the, showing the fulfillment of the uh, promise that he made to King David. It says, um, again, we are in Ichabus begat Joseph, the husband of um, Maria, of whom was born Jesus. So now we're going to go over a few scriptures. Again, concerning Jesus, if you go to Luke chapter 1, verses 32 to 33, it says, And behold, you shall conceive in your womb, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. In other words, the twelve tribes of Israel. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So again, Jesus is a fulfillment of that promise made to King David. 
Now again, when you go to Revelations 22 and 16, verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Jesus himself let you know that he is that offspring of David and the fulfillment of that covenant that God made with King David. So now we're going back. We have, again, I want to go back to verse 16 in the genealogy of Jesus. Verse 16 says, And Ichabus begat Joseph, the husband of um, Maria, whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, this word Christ in the King James Version Bible comes from the Greek word um, Christos, or Christos, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now, Christos, when you translate it back to Hebrew, it is Elohim. So Christ and Elohim means the exact same thing. Now, this next, this next scripture I'm going to go over, I'll go over this scripture in the study titled Peter's Confession of Christ. Um, again, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. Now, again, the word God is not there. The word is there is El. And actually, this is a little out of order. Let me see if I can fix this really quick here. Nope. Yep, there we go. I am L. This means this L means um, Alpha Shepherd. So he's saying, I am the Alpha Shepherd, and there is none else. When he says I'm the Alpha Shepherd and there is none else, he means there is none else coming to save you. I'm the Alpha Shepherd. I'm the one who leads the sheep. I'm the one who saved the sheep. I'm the one who laid down my life for the sheep. It says, I am God. Now, again, the word God is not there in the original scriptures. The word that is there is Elohim. So remember the form of things of old. I am El, and there is none else. I am Elohim. So he's saying, I am Christos. I am Christ. Now, what I have here, if you take the word Elohim and translate it back to the ancient Hebrew, these are the symbols that will replace the modern Hebrew. So again, you have the ox head. This is a shepherd's staff. This is uh, two arms being raised, an open hand, and these are like water waves. And the way you will read this in ancient Hebrew is, the again, the alpha shepherd, or you can just say what we call um, God, the alpha shepherd. This means behold my power and my might. And we're going to explain what his power and his might is in a second. But if you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Again, this is L. And I'm sorry I have these two letter backwards here. Again, I'll try to fix it really quick if I can. There we go. This is L. Um, so again, Ephesians 6 is 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Again, air and in the power of his might. It says, and there is none like me. There's none like Christ. There's none like um, Elohim. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. So he's telling you what his power and his might is. He declared What's going to happen in the end, in the very beginning. And again, if you go back to the um, Peter's confession of Christ, we kind of go over some of the things he declared in the beginning. Um, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. So again, he declares the end from the beginning. And in the ancient times, he lets you know what's going to happen in the end. That is why we have the book of Revelations today. So we know what's going to happen in the end. He's um, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure, which means he said it. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to change it. 
That's his power and his might. So now, one of the things I wanted to go talk to again, talk to you about really quick, again, is that name Elohim. Uh, Elohim, you can look it up in a concordance. It is the Hebrew reference numbers 430. And again, um, this is 4 through 0. And here you go, um, Elohim. I just um, printed, I just did a print screen and pasted it so you can see Elohim with that Hebrew reference number. Now, the Strong's number, H430, um, as you can see, matches the Hebrew word Elohim. Elohim occurs 2,606 times in 2,000. 249 verses in the Hebrew Concordance. So I can't go over all the scriptures of Elohim, but if you open up Accordance and look up Elohim, Elohim and Christ means the same thing. So what I'm going to do is just go over a few scriptures here. And I'll kind of blow this up while I go over these scriptures. So it says, in the beginning, Elohim, this is Christ, created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 and 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of Christ walked upon the face of the waters. I cover Genesis verses 1 and 2 in the study titled, The Sign of Emmanuel. Um, Genesis 1 and 27, so Christ, Elohim, Christ created man in his own image. In the image of Christ created he him, male and female created he them. So if anybody want to argue after that, that Christ is the Elohim in the book, in the Old Testament, there's no more dispute that Christ is God. When you go to, we're going to Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34, we're back at the, um, main topic the two when the two blind men received their sight it says and the multitude rebuked them because rebuked them um, because they should hold their peace so the next things I'm going the next thing I'm going to point at, go over um, is why did the multitude rebuke them and tell them to hold their peace it says but they cry the more saying have mercy on us O Lord son of David if you go back to um, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20, this is Petros' confession of Christ. And again, we go over this in the study titled Peter's Confession of Christ. Um, verse 13 says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And again, the Son of Man is short for Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, when you translate that back to the ancient Hebrew, it is um, he who trails water or walks on water. The son of man is the alpha shepherd. And verse 14 says, and they said, some say um, Eonis, the Baptist, or Yachin the Baptist. Some Elias, and others Jeremiah's. Or one of the prophets. And again, I'll go over this in detail in the, <clears throat> in the study titled Peter's Confession. He said unto them, But whom say you that I am? And Simon Petros answered and said unto him, You are the Christ. So what was Petros saying? He was saying, You are the Elohim, the Son of the living God. You are the Elohim in the beginning. That created the heavens and the earth. You are the Elohim that moved upon the face of the waters. You are the Elohim that created man in his own image. The son of the living God. So the people knew that Elohim was the son of the living God. Verse 17 says... And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That just means the, um, um, I'll skip that Simon Barjona. 
for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Petros, and upon this rock, I mean, this rock is talking about a stone, those living stones, I will build my church. That is the house that we just talked about in um, 2 Samuel chapter 7. So again, he says, and I will build my church, that's that house, and the gates of hell. And, this, and again, this word hell uh, really means Hades. It represents the grave or death shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And we go over what those keys of the kingdom is in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, when we um, went over the subsection of scriptures known as the keys to the kingdom. It says, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, if you want more information about the, what these keys um, of the kingdom is, you have to go back to this study. But now verse 20 says, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus, when you translate that back to Hebrew, is God crucified and resurrected. So you shall not, they, um, he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he is Jesus the Christ, the Elohim. The God from the beginning. So now, I'm just going to go over another verse. The reason, so this is the reason why they rebuked them that they should hold their peace because um, God commanded his disciples to tell no man. The reason Christ commanded his disciples to tell no man, if you go to Matthew chapter 26, Verses 57 through 68. This is uh, when Jesus is before the Sanhedrin. And we just covered this uh, subsection of scriptures in the third prediction of death when we covered uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. It says, but, he, but Jesus held his peace. And the high priest, which is the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes, answered and said unto him, I command you by the living God that you tell us whether you be the Christ. So they were saying, tell us whether you be Elohim, the son of God, the God in the beginning that created the heavens and the earth. Jesus saith unto him, you have said. In other words, Christ was saying, you have spoken correctly. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power. In other words, that's Christ's ascension into the heavens and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's Christ's second coming. Then the high priests tore their clothes, saying he has spoken blasphemy. And the reason they were saying he has spoken blasphemy is because Christ just said he was Elohim. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. What think you? They answered and said, he is guilty of death for claiming to be Elohim. So the reason they asked the people um, to hold their peace because Christ knew once the Pharisees and the Sadducees had this information that they was going to condemn him to death. So we have verse 48 in Mark. It says, And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he, talking about the blind man, cried the more a great deal. So now the reason I have cried, he, but he cried the more a great deal is because now I want to focus on the importance of him crying the more the great deal. And again, it says, Son of David, have mercy on me. So when you go to Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 13, the subsection of scriptures is known as Acts Seek Not. I actually have a study titled Acts Seek Not. But the last time I go over this subsection of scriptures was in the study 
um, titled Boy with a Demon when we cover Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 21. It says, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at 12 o'clock at night and say unto him, friend, um, friend, for a friend of mine is in his journey and come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within, talking about from within the house, shall answer and say, trouble me not. In other words, leave me alone. It's 12 o'clock at night. The door is now shut and my children are in the bed. Sleep. I cannot rise up and give you. I say unto you, Although he will not rise up and give him because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity, in other words, because his constant begging and knocking on the door, he will rise up and give him as many as he need. Now, I want to go over Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. This is the faith of the Canaanite woman. We're going to apply this parable um, to the case of the Canaanite woman. And again, we go over this subsection of scripture in both um, Boy with the Demon and also in the study titled Canaanite Woman's Faith. It says, Then Atah, or Iesus, Atah is just a Hebrew um, name for Iesus, went hence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. So in other words, if you, uh, if you go back to the parable, um, the woman was asking the son of David or Christ to lend me three loaves. <clears throat> my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So, he's, she, so again, the woman is asking Christ to do a favor that is really beneficial to somebody else. Um, to tie that back into the parable, it says, For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before the table for him. So this woman is going to Christ because she can't heal her own daughter. But he answered her not a word. So again, in the parable, trouble me not, leave me alone. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cry after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So again, that's the part of the parable that just means the door is now shut. Then came she and worshipped. And again, this word worship means kissing the feet of him, saying, Lord, help me. She's begging. But he answered and said, is it not appropriate to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs? Now, again, to tie that into the parable from Luke, children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you their bread. And she said, truly, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. So, again, yet because of her importunity, he will rise up and give her as many as she need. Verse 28 says, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you, even as you wish. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now we go back to verse 38. It says, He, talking about the blind man, cried. This cry represents begging, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. Just like they asked um, Christ to send the woman away. They tell him this, you got the same thing. Hold your peace. Be quiet. But he cried. He begged so much the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the Asus, because of the blind men importunity, that constant begging stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good, good comfort, 
Arise. He called you. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him. And Jesus stood still and called him and said, What will you that I should do unto you? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will um, you that I should do unto you? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Saying, What will it that I should do unto you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. In Matthew verse 33, they say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be open. So Jesus had compassion on them. He gave them what they asked for because of their constant begging. He touched their eyes and immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Verse 52 says, and Jesus said unto him, go your way, your faith hath made you whole. And immediately he received his sight. And followed Jesus in the way. And Mark verse 42 says, And Jesus said unto him, Receive your sight, your faith hath saved you. And immediately he received his sight, and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise unto God. And this concludes this message.